the shooting range. In this episode, pages of history, tank EVs, tips and tricks, planes with big guns, and metal beasts, a provocative British deck-based jet. War Thunder had introduced gunless bombers quite a while ago, so it's no surprise to anyone now. But a fighter with neither guns nor gun parts? What? Well, please welcome the C Vixen FAW Mark II, a premium British deck-based jet fighter with a battle rating of 8.3. Its power plant is a twin turbojet engine. The wing and the fuselage house self-sealing fuel tanks, while the nose hides the radar. For suspended armament, it has bombs of various calibers, guided and unguided missiles. The first thing that catches your attention in this jet is, of course, its looks. The twin boom layout with an elevated tail fin, the tail booms protruding ahead of the wing leading edge, the cockpit. Uh, the whole thing looks like a mid-20th century sports car. And the Vixen is no stranger to speed itself, being capable of outracing most of its competitors with the same BR. But if you're being invited to a dogfight, you'd best refuse politely. Not that this plane is too clumsy for slower speed duels, but what's the point if you have no guns? Moreover, the plane's area is too big to make dodging enemy volleys an easy task. On the plus side, its sturdiness is simply great. You can make the sharpest of turns at maximum speed with no fear of losing a wing. Now, the most important part of any fighter is its weaponry. As we've already mentioned, this machine has no guns, and the only way to attack other planes is the Red Top air-to-air -air missile. It's a good one, especially for such a low battle rating. But a skilled pilot can still dodge it. And while other fighters in that case can give the enemy a spray of bullets, the only thing the Vixen can do is uh, fly by. Basically, your best chance to score an air frag is to find an enemy too engaged in a fight. That's when the 30 kilos of TNT in the missiles can please your heart with a beautiful explosion. How about mixed battles? At this BR, there are no SAMs, so you can choose a couple of bullpups against SBAAGs. For a full load, take two more air-to-air -air missiles and two 500-pound bombs. The latter can be dropped individually, by the way. How do you use all of that? Simple. Gain some altitude, dive at the enemy anti-air emplacement, destroy it with guided missiles, find a place to park your bombs, and make it back to the airfield. To lose speed quickly, you have an efficient air brake and flaps. <laughs> Rinse and repeat. Uh, oh, sorry. I, I mean reload and repeat. Express missile and bomb delivery. Many of us are familiar with electric trams, trains, and even buses. Hybrid and electric engines are gaining popularity in private automobiles too. But how about electric engines in armored vehicles? Let's go way back in history to the times of the First World War. Engineers working on early tanks had to solve the task of transferring the power of the engine to the tracks. You can't connect them directly, obviously, which means a transmission is needed. But which kind? Mechanical transmissions were still primitive and could not boast a good level of control. Electric ones, however, looked pretty appealing. A generator could convert the mechanical force of the internal combustion engine into electrical energy for two electric motors. And since each track would have its own engine, it would be easy to make a turn simply by changing each engine's speed separately. The French were the first to implement this solution in a real vehicle, and their electric transmission tanks even saw real combat 
on the World War I battlefields. In the early 1940s, the Americans tested various types of transmissions on their T-1 heavy tanks, with the electric one scoring one of the best levels of performance. Moreover, on their way to the Pershing, the American engineers built a batch of 250 T-23 medium tanks running the same solution. The Germans started building the heavy Porsche Tigers with a gasoline electric drive, later converting them into Ferdinand heavy tank destroyers. The Soviet Union was no stranger to electric drives either. The KV-1S and the IS-6 had them. By the way, the IS-7 was originally designed to be electric too. The British had their own prototypes, and even the Czechs. Basically, pretty much everyone and their grandma tried to create a tank with an electric transmission. It's unsurprising since the list of advantages looked pretty impressive. For instance, the regular mechanical gearbox changes torque and RPM in steps. The driver has to choose one of the predefined ratios and it's rarely perfect for the environment. There's often a situation where the machine could move faster if it had a more suitable gear. An electric engine, however, doesn't need a gearbox to change its torque smoothly. It doesn't even need a driver to do anything to adapt to a new environment. If a tank drives off a good road towards a field, the RPM goes down, while the torque automatically goes up. Meaning, a tank with an electric transmission shows excellent torque off-road, smooth operation, and good handling. Despite all of that, electric transmission remained pretty much exotic. And why would that happen? The first reason was its enormous mass. The Porsche Tiger's two generators and two electric engines had a mass of almost four times that of the Tiger's mechanical transmission. The second reason was the high price and the need for a lot of precious metals. A single transmission for a Porsche Tiger required almost a ton of copper, ten times what the whole Henschel Tiger needed. So, back in those days, the electric engine could not win the battle against hydromechanical transmissions. But who knows about the future? Technical progress brings more compact and efficient electric drives. We might see their return at some point in the future. When aircraft attack ground vehicles, they use bombs and rockets in most cases. But there's another type of weapon, more rare. Huge guns. And that's what we're going to discuss today. The Soviet Tech Tree, for instance, has a number of planes equipped with the 37mm NS-37 cannon, such as the Yak-90 fighter. Its AP rounds can easily penetrate enemy tanks' roofs, or even sides in some cases. On top of that, the Yak shows great flight performance and its cannon is placed in the front, providing a high level of accuracy. Just dive at the target from above and make a few sniper shots at the engine compartment. The caliber isn't that big, so it's sensible to try and set fire to the enemy instead of one-shotting. As soon as the tank catches fire, turn around and repeat the procedure. Similar tactics can be employed on the German Pugzestur. By the way, we recommend choosing the APT belt since its penetration is still enough, while the explosive damage is much higher than with the HVAPT belt. The British Hurricane Mark IV and the Tempest Mark V, with their 40 and 47 mm cannons respectively, are trickier to use. Their cannons are installed under the wings and have a noticeable recoil. Both machines dip their noses while firing, making low-level attacks much more difficult to pull off. There's a high chance your plane encounters a random anti-aircraft tree after the very first volley. Well, these were big cannons, but here come the real monsters. The American PBJ-1H and the XA-38, the German HS-129B-3, and the Japanese Ki-109. 
all of them can boast tank caliber 75mm guns. There's still some difference between the planes, of course, and in the ways you can use them effectively. The XA-38 is a most versatile one. Both nose diving and low-level attacks are possible here. Just make sure you hit the combat compartment. The powerful shells will do the rest. The PBJ and the Ki-109 are based on bomber designs, so they're incapable of sharp maneuvers, which limits the pilots in their tactics. The best way to perform an attack is in a flat dive, preferably along a trajectory aimed at the enemy's side. You should also start firing early to make more shots. The Henschel needs a similar tactic, but its flight performance is even more demanding. The engines barely show any acceleration, so after you finish an attack, fly away before making a turn since you don't want to spend too much time in the sights of angry tankers. The good thing about the Henschel is that its gun is capable of damaging enemy vehicles even from the front. Finally, here's the current record holder for the largest aircraft cannon, the P-108A. Its 102mm cannon can penetrate up to 120mm of armor at one kilometer away. It could be fearsome, but for one small detail. Oh, well, eh, rather, a big one. The P-108 is a huge four-engine bomber. Aiming that monster is hard even when your enemy is standing still, much less moving around. Well, that's it for the biggest aircraft cannons for today. But soon enough, you'll see them again. And at that time, competing in a challenge. Don't miss it. Meanwhile, it's high time we answered some of the questions you ask us in the comments. The first question was sent by a player called Easy Sinks. What are the little propellers on the back of bombs for? Hello! It's actually called a propeller fuse. It tops a special rod which is inserted into a bomb to block the detonator. When a plane drops the bomb, the airstream begins to turn the propeller. Thanks to it, the rod gets unscrewed out of the bomb, flying elsewhere, while the detonator switches to the armed position so that it goes off when the bomb hits something. Dan asks, what is the best play style for the Leopard 2K? Hi Dan, it's a highly mobile machine, so flanking is a great tactic. Don't forget about the 20mm cannon either. It's good enough to damage the enemy's barrel and tracks. Another question comes from X Devil's Chariot X. How do you hide the UI when viewing replays if you want to record a video? Hi there. The default key combination for this is Alt-Z, but if you want something else, you can change it by going to Controls, Common, Interface, Hide, HUD. Sturmovaka or Bataka writes, Why modern MBTs doesn't have composite armor on the sides of the chassis? Hello there. It's a compromise for modern MBTs. By improving the front armor, the engineers need to sacrifice the sides, otherwise the tanks would be too huge and heavy. And the last comment for today was written by Chaos Saber. How damaged can a vehicle get before being destroyed? Hi Chaos Saber. How about we check it right now? We need a test subject, say the T-95, and a couple of assistants. After a few minutes, we managed to damage all four tracks, the barrel, the gun breech, the sights, the machine gun, the engine, the transmission, the radiators, <laughs> even the optics. Looks like vehicles can sustain a lot of damage. As long as you have enough crew to continue the battle, you're in it, soldier. 
Once more, that's it for today. Dismissed! You've been watching The Shooting Range by Gaijin Entertainment. And the next episode will premiere the following Sunday at 4 p.m. GMT or noon Eastern Time. Subscribe and click the bell if you don't want to miss our next videos, which of course you don't. Don't forget to clean and polish your plane's big cannon. Leave a like, share your thoughts and comments, and yeah, we'll see you next week.